All right. I'm, I'm going to do a video today on the Kata Upanishad. And this is one of the uh, 108 Upanishads. It's actually, there's something like 14 um, yoga relevant <clears throat> Upanishads. And this is one of those 14. And 108 is kind of like the magic number, although there, there are more than 108 Upanishads, but there's classically supposed to be 108 Upanishads. What are the Upanishads? Uh, <clears throat> the Upanishads are a, a genre of literature, of, of sacred scripture uh, in the Hindu tradition. They are um, considered to be part of of the Ve the Vedas, but they're kind of later, and and that's why sometimes they're 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 considered to be the end of the Vedas. Um, they they are the what is looked at as the foundational text of Vedanta. Vedanta means uh, the end of the Vedas or the essence of the Vedas. And wh why is that? Because they have the spiritual teachings, um, the high, you could say the highest spiritual teachings of the Hindu tradition. And I want to mention that Hinduism uh, is not, was not the original name, of course, um, for the tradition, for what is now called the Hindu tradition, but <clears throat> the real name or the original name was Sanatana Dharma. Sanatana Dharma meaning, meaning the eternal way. Um, dharma has many, many meanings. It can mean religion, it can mean righteousness, it could mean law, morality, um, the moral order of things. It could mean duty, obligation, and, and so on. Um, but I, I like the translation of way for Sanatana Dharma, for Dharma in, in Sanatana Dharma. <clears throat> and it, it really is the idea that um, you find in this tradition that really incredible teachings about the soul and, and the nature of reality. And to this day, obviously, if you look at, at the um, impact that, that yoga has had on the world, uh, by now, it's huge. It's, it's just an ongoing, um, amazingly huge impact. And the word yoga really goes back to these texts, the Upanishads. And we, that, that's where we really find the first use of the word yoga. And that's what we want to talk about. And we wanna, we're going to talk about it in light of this text called the Kata Upanishad. Kata means story. Um, and this Upanishad um, tells a story. A, a lot of the Upanishads, um, especially the, the major ones, I'm not aware of all of them. I, you know, I, I'm not an expert by any means on, on these texts, but I, I know that there's a bunch of stories that are in, in the Upanishads. But this Upanishad is essentially a, just a story. Um, whereas the other Upanishads have stories in them, but they're not a full on story. So um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna just read through this, this uh, Upanishad and uh, we're gonna, talk a little bit about the meaning as we read. Sometimes it really helps to have someone who is uh, shedding a little light on what the, what the text means. So that, that's, that's what I'm going to be doing today. Um, by the way, this book, um, I, I published this book. It's on Amazon. I published it this past year. It's called That Thou Art. 
um, classic source texts in the study, practice, and, ex and experience of Advaita Vedanta. And basically what this is, is just an anthology of texts from the, from the Sanatana Dharma or Hindu tradition. And they're specifically texts in English that relate to Vedanta or specifically Advaita Vedanta. What is Advaita? Let's talk about that just for a moment before we even get into Kata Upanishad. Advaita, so Dvaita, the word Dvaita is a Sanskrit word meaning two, two-ness or duality. Uh, and whenever you have a, a short ah, uh, or just about whenever you have a short ah uh before a word in, in Sanskrit, it negates that, that short ah, uh, it's really like a uh, a Dvaita. It negates the, the word that it comes in front of. So in this case, Advaita would mean non-duality. That's how it's usually translated. And in, in fact, that's where the word non-duality that we have comes from that, comes from, from the Sanskrit Advaita. Advaita. Uh, Advaita, what does it mean? That, that is the question, and that is really what we need to talk about. But let's just, let's just say, put it, we'll put it very simply, which is we all have know this idea that we actually kind of know from the Judeo-Christian tradition, or you could even say Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition, which is that God is love, okay? Um, now, if God is love, you know, the, the, the question that everyone has is if, if God is love, why is there suffering? Why is there suffering in the world? Why is there suffering? Why do I suffer? Why do I see so much suffering all around me? Um, why, you know, couldn't have, couldn't God have created a world in which there was just, you know, everyone was happy, healthy, and lived forever, you know. And um, why, why is that not the case if God is love? Um, and in some traditions, you know, we could go, we could really go into the subject, but this is not, we're not going to do it right at this moment. Maybe later in this talk, we will. Um, but right now we can just say, uh, some traditions say, yes, God is love, but, but there are other forces at work in the universe. For instance, there's, there's a devil or there's Satan and Satan is at war with God. And because of the satanic influence or the, or the demonic influence, um, you know, there, there is suffering. Um, now, the question though is, if God is love, and you could say if God is omnipotent, meaning God is all powerful, why would God allow those, you could say, dark forces to, to have a role in, in, in human life in, or in, in, in the universe? And um, there's different ways of, of getting at this question and, and different religions have different approaches. Some say that the Bible itself is, has different approaches. It doesn't have just one monolithic approach to the question of what God is and, and why, do, why do people suffer. By the way, there's a, there is a term for this, for the study actually of of, um, you know, how God could allow suffering. And that term is called theodicy. Theodicy is, is um, it's actually more of a theological term that means justifying God, justifying God, essentially, or, or 
explaining why there is suffering, why God allows suffering or why there is suffering. Right now, Sunny, our baby is knocking on the door. <laughs> so you probably hear him knocking. Um, I would love to open the door, but then we wouldn't get this video done probably. Um, maybe there's a connection between that and what, what I was just talking about. But um, in any case, Advaita means that God, God is love and that's all there really is. There's only love. There is only, or God, you know, whatever term you want to use. But the, the word that makes the most sense to most of us is love. A lot of people have an issue with the term God, you know, not everyone, but, but some people, they, when they hear the word God, it makes them kind of like bristle or it's like, don't talk to me about God. Um, but if you say love, most people are like, oh, yeah, love, right, love. Um, and then if you say God is love, then it sounds a little bit too religious or, you know, and, and it's like, could you just leave God out of the picture? <laughs> But you could actually just say love, that, that, that love is the only reality and everything else is a, um, is a dream that somehow, this is, you could say the Advaita perspective, that, that somehow this, this happened, this dream seemed to have happened that in which there is suffering, but it's not real. And that's really what we want to get at. And, and, and hopefully this Upanishad is going to help to, um, to give us a little bit of understanding of, of all of this, of Vedanta and Advaita Vedanta. All right. So let's read. We're going to read this. It starts with a little invocation. Om, may Brahman protect us both. May Brahman bestow upon us both the fruit of knowledge. May we both obtain the energy to acquire knowledge. May what we both study reveal the truth. May we cherish no ill feeling toward each other. This is a mantra. Uh, I'm going to say the mantra in Sanskrit. It's a famous mantra. It's actually a mantra between student and, I'm sorry, teacher and student, or guru and disciple. And the, the mantra is Om Sahana Bhavatu Sahana Bhunatu Sahaviryam Karavavahi Tejasvina Bhatitamastu Ma Vidvishavahi Om Shanti 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 Hi so this, this mantra is, um, or invocation is, is a way of saying, may we, may we learn together in harmony, in peace, in harmony, and may there be no um, ill will between us. Okay, chapter one of the Kata Upanishad. Vajasravasa, desiring, desiring rewards, performed the Visvajit sacrifice in which he gave away all his property. He had a son named Nachiketa. When the gifts were being distributed, faith entered into the heart of Nachiketa, who was still a boy. He said to himself, Joyless, surely, are the worlds to which he goes, who gives away cows no longer able to drink, to eat, to give milk, or to calve. He said to his father, Father, to whom will you give me? He said this a second and a third time. Then his father replied, Unto death will I give you. Among, among many I am the first, or among many I am the middlemost. But certainly I am never the last. What purpose of the king of death will my father serve today by thus giving me away to him? Nachiketa said, look back and see how it was with those who came before us and observe how it is with those who are now with us. A mortal ripens like corn and like corn he springs up again. Verily, like fire, a Brahmin guest enters a house. 
the householder pacifies him by giving him water and a seat. Bring him water, O king of death. By the way, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to look for a different translation. Give me one second. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to look online. I have a different translation by Iknat Eswarin. Um, some translations are a little bit harder to follow. And I like his um, translation. So give me one second. Iknat, let's, let's see if we can find it. It's, you can read this free online. It's, it's free. Um, here it is. It's on wiki. I will, I will send the link to this or post the link. All right, but basically what's happening is there's this father, he's, he's offering sacrifice of cows and his son basically calls him on it and says, you know, what is the, what, what do you really think you're gonna achieve by giving away these old cows? Um, you know, what, what, what is that gonna do for you? You know, you think you're going to you're going to gain some kind of religious merit. And then his father gets really mad at him and says, basically, go to hell. <laughs> and he actually does go to hell. He goes to the underworld. All right. And. Um, Yama Nachiketa went to Yama's abode, but the king of death was not there. He waited three days. When Yama returned, he heard a voice say, when a spiritual guest enters the house like a bright flame, he must be received well with water to wash his feet. Far from wise are those who are not hospitable to such a guest. They will lose all their hopes, the religious merit they have acquired, their sons and their cattle. O oh, spiritual guest, I grant you three boons to atone for the three inhospitable nights you have spent in my abode. Ask for three boons, one for each night. So this story is a little bit like the um, Aladdin story of you get three wishes, right? So Yama basically says to Nachiketa, you, you went down to the underworld, to my abode, to my home, and I was not there to greet you. And in India, in this tradition, the guest is, there's a saying, the guest is God. And so if you do not, you're not, you're not, if you're not there to greet the, the guest, then you owe the guest something. So he's going to give him three wishes, three boons. Okay. Um, first he says, uh, Nachiketa says, O king of death, Yama, as the first of these boons, grant that my father's anger be appeased, so he may recognize me when I return and receive me with love. And then Yama says, I grant that your father, the son of Uralaka and Aruna, will love you as in the past. When he sees you released from the jaws of death, he will sleep again with a mind at peace. Nachiketa, there is no fear at all in heaven, for you are not there, neither old age nor death. Passing beyond hunger and thirst and pain, all rejoice in the kingdom of heaven. You know the fire sacrifice that leads to heaven, O king of death. I have full faith in you and ask for instruction. Let this be your second boon to me. Yama says, yes, I do know Nachiketa and shall teach you the fire sacrifice that leads to heaven and sustains the world, that knowledge concealed in, that knowledge concealed in the heart. Now listen. And then the narrator says, then the king of death taught Nachiketa how to perform the fire sacrifice, how to erect the altar for worshiping the fire from which the universe evolves. When the boy repeated his instruction, the dread king of death was well pleased and said, Yama, let me give you a special boon. This sacrifice shall be called by your name, Nachiketa. Accept from me this many-hued chain, too. Those who have thrice performed the sacrifice realize their unity with father, mother, and teacher, and discharge the three duties of studying the scriptures, ritual worship, and giving alms to those in need. Rise above birth and death, knowing the god of fire born of Brahman, they attain perfect peace. Those who carry out this triple duty, conscious of its full meaning, will shake off the dread noose of death and transcend sorrow to enjoy the world of heaven. Thus have I, have I granted you the second boon, Nachiketa, the secret of the fire that leads to heaven. It will have your name. Ask now, Nachiketa, for the third boon.
Okay, so just to summarize that part. So the second boon or the second wish that Nachiketa has is he wants to know this fire sacrifice and, and that leads to heaven. And, and Yama says to him, all right, I will give it to you. And I'm going to even give you, I'm going to throw in a couple things. I'm going to, I'm going to name it after you. So this fire sacrifice is now going to be called Nachiketa. And I'm going to give you this chain to wear. <laughs> so, um, so there's something going on there, but, but, but Yama's being very generous. Um, but in any case, that's the second boon. Third, third boon, Nachiketa. When a person dies, there arises this doubt. He still exists, say some. He does not, say others. I want you to teach me the truth. This is my third boon. Yama says, this doubt haunted even the gods of old. For the secret of death is hard to know. Nachiketa asked for some other boon and released me from my promise. Nachiketa. This doubt haunted even the gods of old, for it is hard to know, O death, as you say. I can have no greater teacher than you, and there is no boon equal to this. Yama says, ask for sons and grandsons who will live a hundred years. Ask for herds of cattle, elephants and horses, gold and vast land, and ask to live as long as you desire. Or if you can think of anything more desirable, ask for that with wealth and long life as well. Nachiketa, be the ruler of a great kingdom, and I will give you the utmost ca capacity to enjoy the pleasures of life. Ask for beautiful women of loveliness rarely seen on earth, riding in chariots, skilled in music, to attend on you. But Nachiketa, don't ask me about the secret of death. Okay, so Nachiketa is saying, you know, he says, for my third wound, I, ne I need to know, you know, what happens when you die? Come on, tell me, tell me the truth. And Yama says, don't, I will give you anything, but don't ask me that question. Do not ask me that question. I will give you anything. Now, there's, there's other stories that, are, that are very much like this. And you probably know, like from the Bible, Solomon is asked, you know, I believe God says to him, you know, you can have anything. I will give you anything that you want. And Solomon says, I only want wisdom. And that's why Solomon was considered to be the wisest, because he didn't want anything except wisdom. Also, in the New Testament, Jesus goes to the desert, and he gets tempted by Satan, and Satan offers him everything. And, and, and Jesus says, uh, you know, no, I forget exactly, you know, what he says, get behind me, Satan, or what, whatever. No, that, that was a different part. But, but he, he um, resists that temptation to have everything in order to have, um, you know, true divine connection. And then in the, in the story of Buddha as well, he gets tempted before enlightenment. Okay. So what's, what is, um, Nachiketa says, he says, these pleasures last, but until tomorrow, and they wear out the vital powers of life. How fleeting is all life on earth? Therefore, keep your horses and chariots dancing and music for yourself. Never can mortals be, be made happy by wealth. How can we be desirous of wealth when we see your face and know we cannot live while you are here? This is the boon I choose and ask you for. Having appro approached an immortal like you, how can I, subject to old age and death, ever try to rejoice in a life for the sake of senses fleeting and fleeting pleasure? fleeting pleasures. Dispel this doubt of mine, O king of death. Does a person live after death or does he not? Nachiketa asks for no other boon than the secret of this great mystery. So Nachiketa is, is uh, he's actually quite an amazing young man. He's, he stays very firm in this question. He's not backing down. He's not, just give me one second here. He's not backing down from this question. He's firm. Um, and it turns out that Yama was just testing him, okay? He, he was just testing him to see if he was really ready. 
And then it says, so having tested young Nachiketa and found him fit to receive spiritual instruction, Yama, king of death, said, the joy of the Atman ever abides, but not what seems pleasant to the senses. Both these, differing in their purpose, prompt man to action. All is well for those who choose the joy of the Atman, but they miss the goal of life who prefer the pleasant. Perennial joy or passing pleasure. This is the choice one is to make always. The wise recognize these two, but not the ignorant. The first welcome what leads to abiding joy, though painful at the time. The latter run goaded by their senses after what seems immediate pleasure. Well have you renounced these passing pleasures so dear to the senses, Nachiketa, and turned your back on the way of the world which makes mankind forget the goal of life. Far apart are wisdom and ignorance. The first leads one to self-realization. The second makes one more and more estranged from his real self. I regard you, Nachiketa, worthy of instruction, for passing pleasures tempt you not at all. So in other words, um, what this is getting at, this, there's two paths, right? Think of, uh, if you know the song, Stairway to Heaven, you know, considered to be one of the greatest at least rock songs of all time. I believe it's one of the great songs of all time. Uh, and what's the message of it? There's two paths. It's the same, same idea. There's two paths you can go on. Don't think that there's more than two paths. There's only two paths. There's the path of wisdom. There's the path of seeking your true self. And then there's the path of forgetting your true self. Um, you're, you're either on one or the other at any given moment in time. Sometimes we do want to remember, we do want to remember, we do want happiness, we do want true love. And then we, and then we make those choices for that. A lot of times we choose to, to do otherwise. Um, some people are really on one or the other. You know, some people are, they just want to know the truth and others are, don't, don't, Tell me about that shit. <laughs> don't, I don't want to hear anything about that. Um, most of us are somewhere in between. And in a way, this Upanishad is for those of us who are kind of open to the idea that we do have a true self that is there to find. Um, okay. I'm just going to keep reading. Ignorant of their ignorance, yet wise in their own esteem, these deluded men, proud of their vain learning, go round and round, like the blind led by the blind, far beyond their eyes, hypnotized by the world of sense, opens the way to immort immortality. I am my body. When my body dies, I die. Living in the superstition, they fall life after life under my sway. It is but few who hear about the self. Fewer still dedicate their lives to its realization. Wonderful is the one who speaks about the self. Rare are they who make it the supreme goal of their lives. Blessed are they who, through an illumined teacher, attain to self-realization. Um, so this passage is almost word to, for word in, also in the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita is also considered to be an Upanishad. And basically Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, there are actually a very few who really seek this goal, which sometimes it's called moksha or mukti, meaning liberation. There are very few, relatively speaking, who really make that what their life is about. Most everyone else is, um, we, we have you know, a thousand different projects that we're, that we're working on in our life. And usually it's not, it's not about finding our true self. That's not our, that's not our priority. And this is, this is saying, um, but that is the goal of life. You know, that is the goal of life. Um, the truth of the self cannot come through one who has not realized that he is the self. The intellect cannot reveal the self beyond its duality of subject and object. They who see themselves in all and all in them help others through spiritual osmosis to realize the self themselves. This awakening you have known comes not through logic and scholarship, but from close association with a realized teacher. Wise are you, Nachiketa, because you seek the self eternal. May we have more seekers like you. Okay, so 
In other words, this is now pointing out the need for a teacher, need for someone who can help you on this path because it's not an easy path. And in fact, you cannot get there usually on your own. You cannot, you can't see it unless someone comes to you and says, this is what we're talking about here. And this, th this is a real thing. This is not made up, but this, we're talking about a real journey that you take to get to enlightenment. And it's not just um, a fantasy. And usually people need someone not only to, sh to, to reveal that to them, but also to help them, to help remind them, because we easily forget. So that's why the, the guru, the value, the guru is valuable. And that is why Yama is like Nachiketa's guru in this story. So Nachiketa says, I know that earthly treasures are transient and never can I reach the eternal through them. Hence have I renounced all my desires for earthly treasures to win the eternal through your instruction. Yama, I spread before your eyes, Nachiketa, the fulfillment of all worldly desires. Power to dominate the earth, <clears throat> delight celestial gained through religious rites, miraculous powers beyond time and space. These with will and wisdom have you renounced. The wise realizing through meditation the timeless self beyond all perception hidden in the cave of the heart leave pain and pleasure far behind. Those who know they are neither body nor mind, but the immemorial self, the divine principle of existence, find the source of all joy and live in joy abiding. I see the gates of joy are opening for you, Nachiketa. Nachiketa says, teach me of that you see as beyond right and wrong, cause and effect, past and future. Yama says, I will give you the word all the scriptures glorify, all spiritual dis disciplines express, to attain which aspirants lead a life of sense, self, I'm sorry, a life of sense restraint and self nodding. It is Om. This symbol of the Godhead is the highest. Realizing it, one finds complete fulfillment of all one's longings. It is of the greatest support to all seekers. Those in whose heart Om rever reverberates unceasingly are indeed blessed and deeply loved as one who is the self. Okay, so now this is just, this is just one short passage here that just says Om. This, this, this passage is just glorifying Om and see, telling us why this, this word, the sacred sound is so important. And we'd have to go more into it maybe another time, but just to remember, and it, this is not the only scripture, almost all of these scriptures talk about Om. All, so many of the Upanishads talk about Om and why Om is so important. But let's go on. The all-knowing self was never born, nor will it die. Beyond cause and effect, this self is eternal and immutable. When the body dies, the self does not die. If the slayer believes that he can slay or the slain believes that he can be slain, neither knows the truth. The eternal self slays not, nor is, nor is ever slain. Again, this is also right in the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says to Arjuna that um, the soul, the Atman, can never be killed, cannot be slain, cannot be um, burned or wet. Uh, it is essentially one with God, but, but that it does usually you know, the individual soul does not know that until the point of self-realization, which is where the individual soul realizes its oneness or the drop realizes its oneness with the ocean. Um, okay. Hidden in the heart of every creature exists the self, subtler, subtler than the subtlest, greater than the greatest. They go beyond sorrow who extinguish their self-will and behold the glory of the self through the grace of the Lord of love. Though one sits in meditation in a particular place, the self within can exercise his influence far away. Though still, he moves everything everywhere. When the wise realize the self formless in the midst of forms, changeless in the midst of change, omnipresent and supreme, they go beyond sorrow. The self, and 
and that's another way of saying they go beyond fear, they go beyond suffering, they go beyond the, let's say, the ego, okay? Um, when the, when the self cannot be known through study of the scriptures, nor through the intellect, nor through hearing learned discourses. The self can be attain, attained only by those whom the self chooses. Verily unto them does the self re reveal himself. That's a, that's a tough one because it seems like a catch-22. The self reveals the self only to the self. <laughs> or the self reveals, I mean, who, if you can't get to the self through study, intellect, um, or anything, how do, you, how do you get to the self, right? That, that, that may be the question. I think this is going to answer that, though. The self cannot be known by anyone who desists not from unrighteous ways, controls not the, his senses, stills not his mind, and practices not meditation. None else can know the omnipresent self, whose glory seeps, sweeps away the rituals of the priest and the prowess of the warrior, and puts death itself to death. So you, you need to do certain things to, to know the self, but just because you do those things like meditation and read the scriptures, et cetera, that doesn't mean you're necessarily going to get there, but um, they are kind of prerequisite to get there. They're, they're like, you know, things you need to, to prepare yourself, preparations. In the secret cave of the heart, two are seated by life's fountain. The separate ego drinks of the sweet and bitter stuff, liking the sweet, disliking the bitter, while the supreme self drinks sweet and bitter, neither liking this nor disliking that. The ego gropes in darkness while the self lives in light. So declare the illuminate sages and the householders who worship the sacred fire in the name of the Lord. So again, um, there's, there's two, um, two ways, two paths. And uh, wh where we're going with all this is the path of getting beyond duality, getting beyond likes and dislikes. Like, I like this, I don't like that. But everything, you start to see everything is the same. Everyone is the same. Everyone is equal. No one is better or worse than, than anyone. And we're all in the same boat here. Um, May we light the fire of Nachiketa that burns out the ego and enables us to pass from fearful fragmentation to fearless fullness in the changeless whole. Know the self as Lord of the chariot, the body as the chariot itself, the discriminating intellect as charioteer, and the mind as reins. The senses say the wise are the horses. Selfish desires are the roads they travel. When the self is confused with the body, mind, and senses, they point out, he seems to enjoy pleasure and suffer sorrow. By the way, this image of the, of the, char the horse in the chariot is also found in the Bhagavad Gita. It's found elsewhere. Um, it's, a, it's a famous um, uh, metaphor. When one lacks discrimination and his mind undisciplined, the, the senses run hither and thither like wild horses. But they obey the rein like trained horses when one has discrimination and has made the mind one-pointed. Those who lack discrimination with little control over their thoughts and far from pure, reach not the pure state of immortality, but wander from death to death. But those who have discrimination with a still mind and a pure heart reach journey's end, never again to fall into the jaws of death. With, with a discriminating intellect as charioteer and trained mind as reins, they attain the supreme goal of life to, to be united with the Lord of love. The sense is derived from objects of sense perception, sense objects from mind, mind from intellect, and intellect from ego. Ego from in, undifferentiated consciousness and consciousness from Brahman. Brahman is the first cause and last refuge. That's a great line. Brahman is the first cause and last refuge. Brahman, the hidden self in everyone, does not shine forth. He is revealed only to those who keep their mind one-pointed on the Lord of love and thus develop a superconscious manner of knowing. Meditation enables them to go deeper and deeper into consciousness, from the world of words to the world of thoughts, then beyond thoughts to, the, to wisdom in the self. 
so in other, in other words this is this is a journey into your mind it's a journey it's going beyond all everything material everything physical the metaphysical as they say is beyond the physical and when we think about thoughts and ideas those are not physical and they the, if we could go back to the to the root of our thought we would get back there to the to the original to the mind of god so to speak um the wise who gain experiential knowledge of this timeless tale of Nachiketa, narrated by death, attain the glory of living in spiritual awareness. Those who, full of devotion, recite the supreme mystery at a spiritual gathering are fit for eternal life. They are indeed fit for eternal life. So maybe um, those of you who are listening, who are taking this seriously and taking it to heart, maybe you are fit for eternal life. I mean, that's what this is saying. <laughs> Um, the self-existing Lord pierced the senses. This is chapter two. The self-existing Lord pierced the senses to turn outward. Thus we look to the world outside and see not the self within us. A sage withdrew his senses from the world of change and seeking immortality, looked within and beheld the deathless self. So in other words, the journey is the journey within. You cannot find it outside yourself. The immature run after sense pleasures and fall into the widespread net of death. But the wise, knowing the self is deathless, seek not the changeless in the world of change. That through which one enjoys form, taste, smell, sound, touch, and sexual union is the self. Can there be anything not known to that who is one in all? No one, no all. That through which one enjoys the waking and sleeping states is the self. To know that as consciousness is to go beyond sorrow. Those who know the self as enjoyer of the honey from the flowers of the senses, ever present within, ruler of time, go beyond fear. For this self is supreme. The God of creation, Brahma, born of the Godhead through meditation before the waters of life were created, who stands in the heart of every creature, is the self indeed. For this self is supreme. The goddess of energy, Aditi, born of the Godhead through vitality, mother of all the cosmic forces, who stands in the heart of every creature is the self indeed, for this self is supreme. The god of fire, Agni, hidden between two fire sticks like a child, well protected in the mother's womb, whom we adore every day in meditation, it is the self indeed, for this self is supreme. That which is the source of the sun and of every power in the cosmos, beyond which neither is neither going nor coming is the self indeed for this self is supreme what is here is also there what is there also here who sees multiplicity multiplicity but not the one indivisible self must wander on and on from death to death only okay so so again um now this is really getting at duality there's nothing wrong with duality and there's nothing wrong with, you know, like seeing Brahma, Brahma, the creator. Now, Brahma is not Brahman. Brahman is that one reality that is everything, that really is everything that we, we can't see it from where we are right now, but it really is all that, that truly is. Um, now, it, it's not a contradiction to also praise or give, or give respect to the gods, you know, so to speak, uh, because they, they, you know, through, through honoring them, we can get back to the, to, to Brahman or to the, or to love or to God, however you want to look at it. Okay. Um, and if you don't see it here in, while you're living, you might not see it later. And that's why you might have to come back reincarnation. This you know, I'm not saying this, this is what, the, you know, these texts are saying is that, you know, you, you, this is the only life, this is the life to do it. This is the lifetime to do it is to, is to realize the self while you're still living and then you will, you can return home again. Um, that thumb sized being enshrined in the heart, ruler of time, past and future, to see whom is to go beyond all fear is the self indeed, for this self is supreme. That thumb-sized being, aflame without smoke, 
ruler of time, past and future, the same on this day as on tomorrow, it is the self indeed, for this self is supreme. As the rain on a mountain peak runs off the slopes on all sides, so those who see only the seeming multiplicity of life run after things on every side. As pure water poured into pure water becomes the very same, so does the self of the illumined man or woman, Nachiketa, verily become one with the Godhead. Let me just see how much longer this is. Okay. Because I'm going to run out of battery here in a moment. There is a city with 11 gates. That means your body, 11 gates, of which the ruler is the unborn self, whose light forever shines. They go beyond sorrow who meditate on the self and are freed from the cycle of birth and death. For this self is supreme. The self is the sun shining in the sky, the wind blowing in space. He is the fire at the altar and in the home and in the home, the guest. He dwells in human beings, in gods, in truth, and in the vast firmament. He is the fish born in water, the plant growing in the earth, the river flowing down from the mountain, for this self is supreme. In other words, the self is everywhere, if we had eyes to see it. The adorable one who is seated in the heart rules the breath of life. Unto him all the senses pay their homage. When the dweller in the body breaks out in freedom from the bonds of, bonds of flesh, what remains? For this self is supreme. We live not by the breath that flows in and flows out, but by him who causes the breath to flow in and flow out. So in other words, that's why prana is not the same as breath. Prana is that the breath behind the breath or, or the, that force that is beho- behind the breath that gives breath, breath. Now, O Nachiketa, I will tell you of this unseen eternal Brahman and what befalls the self after death. Of those unaware of the self, some are born as embodied creatures while others remain in a lower state of evolution as determined by their own need for growth. That which is awake even in our sleep, giving form in dreams to the objects of sense craving, that indeed is pure light. Brahman, the immortal, who contains all the cosmos and beyond whom none can go, for this self is supreme. As the same fire assumes different shapes when it consumes objects differing in shape, so does the one self take the shape of every creature in whom he is present. As the same air assumes different shapes when it enters objects differing in shape, so does the one self take the shape of every creature in whom he is present. As the sun, who is the eye of the world, cannot be tainted by the defects in our eyes or by the objects it looks on, so the one self, dwelling in all, cannot be tainted by the evils of the world, for this self transcends all. So, in other words, um, there's no, for the self, you know, for for what we're talking about, there is a place we can get to beyond suffering, even in our life, even living in this world, there is, there is a way to be in the world, but not of the world, to, to look on suffering and realize that ultimately suffering is not real. It is not, it is not necessary. We do not have to suffer and we do not need to suffer for others, but rather we we can help others more by showing them that suffering is not real and that they do not have to suffer. We do not have to suffer. They do not have to suffer. Um, The ruler supreme, inner self of all, multiplies his oneness into many. Eternal joy is theirs who see the self in their own hearts. To none else does it come. Changeless amidst the things that pass away, pure consciousness in all who are conscious, the one answers the prayers of many. Eternal peace is theirs who see the self in their own hearts. To none else does it come. Nachiketa. So that was a long monologue by by Yama, the god of death. Now Nachiketa. How can I know that blissful self, supreme, inexpressible, realized by the wise? Is he the light or does he reflect light? Yama says, There shines not the sun, neither moon, nor star, nor flash of lightning, nor fire lit on earth. The self is the light reflected by all. He is shining. Everything shines after him. 
it's a very important statement. And there was a statement before that said that this Brahman or the self does not shine forth. It is all, it, it just is. It, it is where we are returning to. When we remove the darkness, we will know the light. And not until we remove all of the darkness will we know the light. Will we truly know the light? The tree of eternity has its roots above and its branches on earth below. Its pure root is Brahman, the immortal, from whom all the worlds draw their life and whom none can transcend. For this self is supreme. The cosmos comes forth from Brahman and moves in him. With his power, it reverberates like thunder crashing in the sky. Those who realize him pass beyond, beyond, sorry, pass beyond the sway of death. In fear of him, fire burns. In fear of him, the sun shines. The clouds rain and the winds blow. In fear of him, death stalks about to kill. If one fit, now, that, that's, that's all metaphor, but we could talk about that, the whole fear in fear of, but maybe another time. If one fails to realize Brahman in this life before the physical sheath is shed, he must again put on a body in the world of embodied creatures. Again, this talking about reincarnation. If you don't get to the goal in any given life, you come back again. Brahman can be seen as in a mirror in a pure heart, in the world of the ancestors as, as in a dream, in the Gandharva world as the reflections in trembling waters, and clear as light in the realm of Brahma. Knowing the senses to be separate from the self and the sense experience to be fleeting, the wise grieve no more. In other words, it keeps saying you, that you go beyond sorrow, you go beyond suffering, sorrow, no more fears, no more tears. Above the senses is the mind, above the mind is the intellect, above that is the ego, and above the ego is the unmanifested cause. And beyond is Brahman, omnipresent, attributeless. Realizing him, one is released from the cycle of birth and death. He is formless and can never be seen with these two eyes, but he reveals himself in the heart made pure through meditation and self sense restraint. Realizing him, one is released from the cycle of birth and death. When the five senses are stilled, when the mind is stilled, when the intellect is stilled, that is called the highest state by the wise. They say yoga is the complete stillness in which one enters the unit of state, never to become separate again. So that's a definition of yoga that's presented here. I'll read that again. They say yoga is this complete stillness in which one enters the unit of state, never to become separate again. If one is not established in the state, the sense of unity will come and go. That's like most of us. We, we get it for a moment, and then we lose it again, and then we go back, right? Um, one step back, two steps forward, hopefully. The unit of state cannot be attained through words or thoughts or through the eye. How can it be attained except through one who is established in the state himself? Again, you have a catch-22 there. You can only get there by getting there. It seems impossible. How do you get there? If you can only, you know, takes one to know one. How do you, so how do you get there? Um, I think the answer is grace. I, I, I have no other, I don't think this explains it either, but um, there are two selves, the separate ego and the indivisible Atman. When one rises above I and me and mine, the Atman is revealed as one's real self. When all desires that surge in the heart are renounced, the mortal becomes immortal. When all the knots that strangle the heart are loosened, the mortal becomes immortal. This sums up the teachings of the scriptures. So that's it right there in that one paragraph, which I'll read again in a moment. From the heart, there radiate 101 vital tracks. One of them rises to the crown of the head. This way leads to immortality, the others to death. The Lord of love, not larger than the thumb, is ever enshrined in the hearts of all. Draw him clear out of the physical sheath as one draws a stalk from the munja grass. Know thyself to be pure and immortal. Know thyself to be pure and immortal. And then the narrator ends with, Nachiketa learned from the king of death the whole discipline of meditation. Freeing himself from all separateness, he won immortality in Brahman. So blessed is everyone who knows the self. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Peace. So uh, I'm going to read that one part. It's a few, 
few verses, says that there are two selves, the separate ego and the indivisible Atman. When one rises above I and me and mine, the Atman is revealed as one's real self. When all desires that surge in the heart are renounced, the mortal becomes immortal. When all the knots that strangle the heart are loosened, the mortal becomes immortal. This sums up the teaching of the scriptures. Okay, again, there's only two things. <laughs> you know, some people say there's only love and there's fear, right? Love is real, fear is not real. Fear, false evidence appearing real. It's an acronym, false evidence appearing real. Um, love is spirit, or in, in, in the yog yogic terminology, love is the Atman, right? Which is, which is really one with Brahman. Brahman meaning, you could say God, Atman meaning the individual soul or, or self, and self-realization means when the individual soul or Atman releases all the fear, goes beyond all fear, which is ego, and to know the true self. When, it, when you release all the knots in the heart, as this says, all the fears that torment you, that, that keep you in despair and depression and suffering and stress, worry, tense, tension, anxiety, all those things. When you release all of those things, then you know, then through a process of elimination, you're back home again, but not until you do that. Um, so, you know, it makes it very simple. If you think about it, there's only two things, right? Um, one of, and one of them is not real. <laughs> uh, if you could just learn to let go of all of that ego stuff and un, really unlearn the ego, you will, you will find yourself back home again. Uh, and the more you, and, and the good news is, is that it, it's not an all or nothing. It, it kind of is all or nothing, but, but along the way, as you release the ego, you feel better and better. Now you might, you still, you could say, living um, in duality, but your duality is a lot happier. It's, as A Course in Miracles says, it's, you're, you're living a happy dream, right? It's still a dream, but it's a lot happier than it was when you were so caught up in the ego. Um, and uh, anyway, let's see where we are here with this, um, what time it is. So I think it's a, this is a good place to stop. Um, so in other words, just to sum, sum it up a little bit, Yama is, is Nachiketa's guru. And he says, first of all, you need a guru, you know, to get, to get up to Mount, the top of Mount Everest, you need a guide, right? You can't think you're going to do it alone without some help. First of all, you need someone to show you to illuminate the path. And that is the person who comes along and says um, what this is saying, which is there's only two things. Right? If, you think there's, if you think there's more than two things, um, you're making it a lot more complicated. But there's only two things. There's, are you choosing fear or are you choosing love in any moment? And the problem is, is that we don't know that we're choosing fear because we're not even aware that we're choosing the ego, that we're, that we're aligning with the ego as opposed to our true self. And that's part of the problem. But, um, you know, through spiritual practice through dis spiritual discipline, you can start to understand how the ego traps you. And as you start to understand that, you can slowly but surely, you, you let go of the ego. More and more and more, the ego dissolves until, until the ego, you realize the ego is nothing. It has no effect whatsoever on anything. And, and you don't have to follow it at all. You don't have to listen to the voice of the ego at all. You can, you can just listen to your heart and follow only your heart. And that is going to uh, make all the difference. All right, thanks for listening and hopefully this was helpful. Namaste. Om. Oh.